Hey everybody, KP here. I am just um, following up on the visit that I had to the Montrouge Cemetery. Um, I did a little research. This is my first time doing this, so I'm not really sure like how I want it to go. So it may be a little rough this time. Also, it's 11.26 p.m. It's like after hours at the dorm, so I'm supposed to be quiet. Um, it doesn't even sound like anybody's here. It's so quiet tonight. Um, but normally my uh, dorm mates come home pretty late. So hopefully I'm not disturbing them doing this. Um, so uh, basically you're supposed to watch the video where I do the cemetery walkthrough first. Um, because in that video, I pose a lot of questions and those questions are actually answered in this video. Um, so I'm not pretending to be an expert on anything. I'm a student. I'm learning. My cemetery walkthroughs are just that. It is me walking through a cemetery, seeing what I see, um, questioning what I see, um, comparing it to what I know of in America, um, and just trying to work through some things, kind of looking for best practices, things that I can take home um, to cemeteries, specifically to minority cemeteries that are in uh, great need of, of assistance in many, many ways, um, and hopefully to improve the situation for these cemeteries, because a lot of minority cemeteries are lacking in funding, they're lacking in manpower and volunteers. Um, a lot of times they don't even have owners or caretakers. Um, and so if it's just um, a couple of descendant families or a few people trying to maintain, um, you know, a, a hundred acre cemetery or whatever the case may be, um, that's costly. And a lot of times people just don't have the means to do that. And these cemeteries become overgrown and eventually sort of lost to time. Um, so anything that I can discover that might help to improve the situation is that's kind of what I'm looking for. All right. So I went online and did some research about the Montrouge Cemetery. Most of what I found was in French and my French is not so great <laughs> as everybody knows now. I'm still working on it. Um, but anyway, so I had my computer translate these websites. Um, some of the translations are kind of iffy. Uh, I think also the French use some terms that haven't become mainstream in the United States yet. Um, so if there's something you don't understand, something that doesn't quite make sense, I try to define things and explain things. Um, in this video, but it's still the possibility that something didn't come out correctly, okay? Um, also, I do not have this information memorized. I'm going to be reading from a script <laughs> um, because this information is sort of scientific in some ways, um, and I am not familiar at all. Some of these concepts I've never heard of before, um, so... <laughs> I, I want to make sure I get it as accurate as possible. Um, my sources for this information come from, let's see, several different places. Um, so Montrouge is actually, a, it was a city, um, I guess like a city, like a community, a commune, something like this, um, before it was incorporated into Paris. Um, so they have like their own website and it's actually a really great website all in French, of course, but it fully explains the city's, uh, philosophy for approach, their approach to being sustainable, um, eco-friendly, um, eco-responsible, uh, just so many other things that we'll get into. Um, but they have like their own city website. So I use that um, www.vmontrouge.fr. Um, and I, I 
really reference an article there called Manage Green Spaces in a 100% Eco-Responsible Way. So most of my information for the cemetery actually comes from this website. I did have to dig through a lot of their writings on this site to pick out bits and pieces here and there about the cemetery to sort of build a complete look, not just at what the city is doing, but how they're using the cemetery to accomplish that. Um, the next thing comes from a website, www.sanecentralurbane.org. Um, and I think this organization, again, this is all in French, so I'm struggling a little bit. Um, but the organization is Plains et Cote de la Seine Centrale Urbaine. No idea what that like translates to. Um, but this site talks about um, zero phyto, uh, the zero phyto approach to caring for green spaces. Um, and so a lot of my information on like zero phyto stuff will come from there. Um, I also used a site, this is actually a company site. I don't like doing this, um, but specifically I was looking for information on a type of tool that's used in the cemeteries to manage weeds. Um, and it's very difficult to find any websites that talked about the impact this tool has on cemeteries and headstones. Um, but anyway, this is a company website, so they are selling a product. Just keep that in mind. So there's some bias behind what they say. Um, but the company is Ripa Green, R-I-P-A, Ripa Green. Um, and their website is ripagreen.com. And they have a little section about weeding in cemeteries on their website. So, um, some of my information about weeding cemeteries will come from there. Um, so those are my three main sites, and I'll also include links to those in the description for the video. Okay, so um, in my research, I could not find the original build date for the uh, Mont Rouge Cemetery. Um, they list a lot of different dates online. Um, with 1820, 1821 being sort of the actual date, but that's not correct. Um, the original Mont Rouge Cemetery, before Mont Rouge was a part of Paris, um, existed well before 1804. Um, we don't, I don't know, I couldn't find an exact date for when it started, but it was built around a parish church. Um, and it was just a, a small cemetery. And then in 1804, um, Napoleon issued a decree um, that set out regulations for cemetery care and for treatment of burials. Um, and he wanted cemeteries built away from homes for hygienic purposes, which I think we all can understand. <laughs> um, and so that began talks of moving the Mont Rouge Cemetery because, you know, parish cemeteries are where people live. It's very close to where people live. Um, and so apparently Mont Rouge, the city, grew very quickly. Um, and it was already growing outside of its boundaries. And the cemetery was becoming extremely full. Um, and so... They needed to sort of enlarge it anyway. Um, so it just made sense to go ahead and move the cemetery to a larger space away from people, sort of two birds with one stone type thing. So in 1819, um, the city council decided to move the cemetery to the location where it is today. Um, so that's sort of where the cemetery starts. Um, it wasn't like founded or anything. It already existed prior to this date, but that's when the city council decided to move it. I'm a little unclear on how they moved it and who was moved. <laughs> um, the city website says, let me see, that the notable people that were buried near the parish church 
were moved to the new location. Um, and so I wonder, was it only like the famous people or <laughs> what? Did you leave everybody else? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I have a lot of questions about that wording. Again, this is being translated, so I don't know how that impacts the meaning. Um, but I, I'm just a little confused about that. But anyway, they moved the notable people <laughs> into the new cemetery location. Um, and then they sort of, it says the first concession opened in 1821. I'm not sure what they mean by concession um, when it comes for a cemetery. So I'm just looking up real quick concession to see like alternative definitions. I don't know. I'm sure somebody out there knows what that means. Um, if you do, like, drop me a message. Let me know. Um, leave a comment or something. Couldn't quite figure it out. Um, and I also don't know if that's a translation of a French idea. Um, I don't know. All right. So anyway, the population of Mont Rouge increased so much that the cemetery was enlarged five times over the next 80 years. So that is tremendous growth for a cemetery. All right, of note in this cemetery, let's see. Ugh, French names, y'all, I'm sorry. Just gonna apologize now because I'm not gonna say them correctly. I'm really sorry. Uh, the first name we have, Henri de Co. He was like a famous uh, French architect and he built the entrance to the cemetery in 1924. And in my video, you will see that I um, kind of take a moment at the end of the video to show you the entrance. Um, so take a look at that when you're looking at the end of the video, you can see that grand structure of an entrance that he built is really quite amazing. He also built a crypt in the cemetery and the sources are kind of weird about this. I looked at a lot of different sites about this crypt. Some were saying it's like the only one in like the small cities in Paris. Some were like it's the only one in Paris, which doesn't make sense to me at all. Um, so I, I don't know. There's something special about this crypt, but I'm not clear what that is. If anybody out there knows, let me know. All right, um, so the cemetery is the final resting place for um, authors, painters, politicians, movie stars, TV stars, comedians, you name it. It is like creative central at that cemetery. Um, and I think it's no surprise that um, Mont Rouge holds like some kind of creative arts type festival every year. They've been doing it for the past 50 years. Um, I even think I saw a sign for it when I was leaving the cemetery, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't record it on video or anything. It's just something when I was walking home, I was kind of like, oh, I wonder what this is. Um, it was like a whole building and like a giant billboard and it looked like a set aside space for some kind of creative purpose. So that's kind of cool. Um, so the most famous person buried there is Coluche. Not sure how to say that. C-O-L-U-C-H-E. It's actually this man's nickname. Um, he's like a famous um, actor, writer, TV star, movie star. Like he's done it all. Um, he's a producer. He produced a ton of movies um, back in like the 80s. Um, sort of an irreverent guy who went against like the status quo. Um, I, I don't, I've never heard the name before, but he's there. And in fact, in my video, I actually go over to his headstone. It catches my attention. It's not a headstone. It's like a giant monument thing. Um, but if I can, in this video, when I go back in editing, I'll add a picture here so you can see what I'm talking about. 
that's a very unusual um, monument. All right, so Marouge the city includes the cemetery and several of their citywide efforts, um, such as the May 8th ceremony commemorating the Allied forces victory over the Nazis. Um, and they have this like wreath hanging ceremony at the cemetery. Um, they also incorporate the cemetery into their zero phyto slash eco responsible green space movement. And there's a sort of my wording to group all of these things under one term. Um, and the cemetery actually houses the city's first flower meadows. Um, and in the video, you'll see I actually stopped by one of the flower meadows and tried to like translate the sign there. Um, but there are 6,000 meters squared of flower meadows just in the cemetery alone. That's more than any other green space in the whole city. Um, so that is epic. The cemetery is a, a major part of this sort of eco-responsible movement that the city has going on. All right, so we're going to talk about the city a little bit because it's really important to understand their philosophy so that we can understand how the cemetery fits into that philosophy. Uh, I think this is really important. I feel like this is important for... Americans to really grasp and to understand, not just for cemetery care, but for like basic human life, <laughs> for life on this planet. Um, it's a really major concept that the whole city of Mont Rouge has decided to take on and to incorporate into their daily lives. They have changed everything they do in this city so that they can do it the right way. Um, and I'm saying right way, but what I mean is the way that science tells us is the most eco-friendly at this point in time. Um, that doesn't mean it won't change in the future as we get new information, but I have no doubts that Mont Rouge will change with the times because they're already so far ahead of any other city to me. Like this, this is pretty amazing stuff. Um, so they have a stated objective to maintain all green spaces in a 100% eco-responsible way. And that is a direct quote from their website. Um, so this effort is impressive and the cemetery is a prime location where we can see many of their efforts in effect. And in fact, in the video, when I'm walking through the cemetery, I'm pointing out these things and how cool they are. And I don't even understand at that point in time how cool it really, truly is. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, wow, no, I've never seen that before. But in fact, it's part of a giant effort, a community effort to impact the world in a positive way. Um, and that just makes it even cooler than I knew at the time. Um, so they are preserving biodiversity. Uh, which we'll see there at the cemetery through their natural plantings of flowers, um, through their care for insects, um, and even things that we don't see in the video, like their care for birds, um, for um, the water, uh, making sure that they use water responsibly, um, all kinds of stuff. We'll get into it. Um, they use natural products, so they're trying to get away from like the, the microplastics that are sort of taking over everything. Um, they're trying to stay away from those chemicals that get into our atmosphere, that uh, get into our skin and make people sick, um, things like that. Uh, let's see. They're trying to use biological pest control, and that means no sprays. Um, no chemicals at all. So uh, for one example is introducing the ladybug as a natural predator of aphids. Um, ladybugs eat the aphids and keep the aphids from eating the plants that they want to continue to grow um, because the plants promote other insect life such as bees. 
And one of the prime objectives of Mont Rouge is to restore bees. And they've planted, I think, I say planted, they've set up like five hives throughout the city. Um, and in fact, in my video, you'll see me um, approach, I think it's lavender, some kind of giant purple plant. Looks like lavender to me. And there are bees everywhere down this row of lavender. Um, so I think they are meeting their objectives in major ways at the cemetery. Um, as I just mentioned, installation of hives, um, installation of insect hotels, which we see in like, I don't know, the first 15 minutes of the video, probably. Um, nesting boxes, which we see in the trees as I'm walking through in the video. Um, management of green waste. Um, let me see, do I get into that in here? Well, I'll briefly just say um, management of green waste. Whenever plants die, whenever trees die, anything like that, those leavings are gathered up and they are turned into mulch and put back down to promote new life and new growth, um, which is very, very cool. Just sort of a circle of life thing happening here. Uh, and the cemetery is a major place where they, they do that. Uh, what else? They have drip irrigation, which I didn't see in effect. Um, that may be something that I just can't see, uh, especially in the cemetery. So, um, but the list goes on. I'm going to, like I said, put the link in the description. You should totally go to the website. It's going to be in French. You just right click with your mouse, tell it to translate into English, and you can read it all there in English. The stuff they're doing is amazing and you do want to know about it, especially if you're interested in farming and gardening and community wellness, um, any of these things, <laughs> you know, that this site just has it all and that it blows my mind because it's such a small area in Paris, but they're doing major things. All right, moving on. Um, so in efforts to save energy and reduce noise, they use electric cleaning vehicles. Um, they are renovating the lighting in the whole area to reduce electricity consumption. Um, they have halved their diesel consumption. A lot of that is by um, using these electric vehicles, but also by um, economizing their routes and, and making them more efficient. Um, excuse me, and the list for that actually is, is pretty extensive too. And you can read all about it on the website. I'm just trying to hit like the key points, you know. Um, from my perspective, this is like the most innovative city I've ever heard of. Not that I've been everywhere or heard of every city, but um, I was just blown away by the things I was learning <laughs> on this website. Um, their all-encompassing approach is one worth replicating in cities around the world, in my opinion. Um, of note in the cemetery is the zero phyto weeding objective. Zero phyto, that's Z-E-R-O, like the number zero, and phyto, P-H-Y-T-O, phyto. For the cemetery, this means they use a thermal weeder with hot air and two flame systems on a trolley. Uh, I had no idea what this was when I read it. I'm like, so you're out there with a flamethrower? That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> um, but it's not that, I promise. It's, it's, it kind of is, but it's not. Um, additionally, the city collects lawn clippings, as I mentioned before, and dead leaves from the cemetery, which are then turned into compost. Okay. And we're going to come back to that thermal weeder in a little bit because I feel like that's a prime or a key point here about um, caring for cemeteries. All right. Objective of um, actions in favor of zero FIDO. These are directly from the city's website. I didn't reword anything. It's, I mean, it's translated, of course, but this is exactly what they say. Okay. So 
In view of the many impacts of phytosanitary products on the environment and health, zero phyto encompasses many objectives. And here is your very long drawn out definition sort of of zero phyto from the French perspective. So you'll reduce the presence of pesticides in water and aquatic environments and more generally the diffuse population of the environment caused by these active substances. I think there's some like grammar stuff happening in here with the translation. Um, but basically they're trying to get pesticides out of the water and out of us. <laughs> um, we don't always realize that the water we drink is never fully clean. It's still contaminated. Um, not to mention if we're growing food in contaminated water, the food becomes contaminated. Um, things like that. All right, so next, mitigate the supposed or proven impact of these molecules on biodiversity. Um, and this gets into like the sciency part of things. Um, I tried not to go too far into the science because it's complicated, y'all. It's so complicated. Um, but since these phytosanitary products are still like being tested, I guess. They weren't ever really tested. <laughs> Not in the way I think they should be. But I guess their impact is still being um, is still being discovered. Um, they're still realizing what microplastics do to us and what um, pesticides do to us. And not just us, but insects and animals and our plant life. Um, the dirt, uh, everything, you know, and not just what we see, but like on a molecular level. Um, and, and it's just, it's kind of crazy when you read about it. Uh, and I can't even begin to explain half of the stuff <laughs> uh, that, that this encompasses. What I can say is the research is so powerful that France has outlawed all of these chemicals and is pushing for everyone to be zero phyto in their um, treatment of green spaces in, in France. Uh, to my mind, that's major. Um, to my mind, that is a country who cares about their people, who cares about their resources, who cares about this planet, and who is trying to push for major change through legislation if needed. And I'm just saying that there's another major country out there, at least one that I know of, wink, wink, that could take some lessons <laughs> on caring for your people and making sure you get rid of unhealthy ways of living. The next thing is to limit the supposed or proven risk of pesticides on human health. Um, continue to reduce the use of phytosanitary products in non-agricultural areas. Reduce exposure to pesticides of municipal services and employees of landscaping companies. Um, this one's really interesting because I don't know if you've ever had someone come through, like if you've lived in an apartment complex or something um, and there's like a management company and maybe three times a year or something like that, they come through and they just spray the whole complex inside and out for like roaches, spiders, ants, like all of these kind of things, right? And you'll see the guys that come through are dressed and protective gear, but they're spraying around families who have no protective gear. And I've even talked with people sometimes. I'm like, oh, it's not harmful. It's fine. And I'm like, but why are you dressed in like a full hazmat suit? <laughs> While me and my kids are running around here, breathing this stuff in, getting it on our skin. You know, it's probably getting into our food. Um, like, what's the deal? And actually, a lot of times those workers, 
in the past did end up getting like cancer um, and other illnesses as a result of working with these kind of chemicals. So yeah, something to think about. And then finally, uh, they want to limit the presence of these micro pollutants in the waters of the Seine, which is like the major river that runs through Paris, um, <laughs> a major water resource for the Paris conurbation. Ah, that's a word, conurbation, as I look it up. An extended urban area, typically consisting of several towns merging with the sub suburbs of a central city. Got it new word for me so that's their uh six points for being zero phyto um hopefully that helps you understand a little bit more what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it okay so after all of that um and really the goal here is not to have an in-depth understanding it's just to introduce the topic introduce the idea because as I will state again and again in my videos, I am a student, I am learning, and I'm hoping that you will learn right along with me. Um, and if there are experts out there and you are familiar with any of this stuff, you've used it, you know what we're talking about here, go ahead and drop a comment below. Let me know what you know. Teach me because I find this quite fascinating. Um, to my knowledge, it's not being done in the United States, at least not where I live. Um, maybe in like California, because California is like ultra progressive in a lot of these ways, like um, caring for the health of their people. Um, so, yeah, let me know. Where is this happening? How is it happening? Um, are cemeteries involved? I'm just really curious. All right, so let's get back here. Um, thermal weeders. This is something I mentioned earlier. Um, what is a thermal weeder and how does it work? So to my knowledge, there are several different kinds. Um, the kind promoted here in France are electric thermal weeders. The ones I've seen online, especially at this company I mentioned, the Ripa Green Company, they use gas. Um, which does not align with the whole zero phyto thing. Um, so the ones in France are electrical, they're electrically powered, um, and they deliver a thermal shock of 600 degrees Celsius to weeds. Now we deal in Fahrenheit in the United States. Y'all, this is 1,112 degrees Fahrenheit. Yo, that's hot. That is hot, okay? Um, it's amazing these things don't just like combust and start a wildfire. <laughs> um, it, it's really important to note here that it says it delivers a thermal shock. So this is not a flame that's catching it on fire. This is heat, just hot air, okay? Um, what happens to the weeds when this hot air hits them is that their cells burst. Um, and this stops the process of photosynthesis. If they can't photosynthesize, they die, right? Because that is life for them. Um, this actually destroys the weeds within seconds. Um, now, from what I read on several other sites, even though it destroys the weeds, it still may take a couple days before you see visibly see that they are dead and the way this looks is actually what you see in the videos at the cemetery notice how all the weeds are like brown and kind of crunchy crispy looking um like you know right before winter when all the plants kind of get brown and, and crisp i don't know the words here but <laughs> it's that same kind of idea um so it doesn't cut them down it doesn't burn them they still exist they're still there they just aren't reproducing they aren't growing they are dead um, which i mean visually is not beautiful but for all intents and purposes you've protected your cemetery from overgrowth which is kind of my point here uh let's see what else 
Thermal weeding doesn't use any consumables like chemicals or gas canisters. That's what they say, but I did find some sites that do use gas canisters. So, um, But these are ones that were portable. The, electrically, the electrical power ones have a, uh, a cord, um, but the, there's some that's like a backpack you put on your back. Um, and I'm, I cannot stop visualizing flamethrowers here, like the little backpack and you're throwing your flame everywhere, but there's no flame, not like that. Um, anyway, the ones that fit on your back do come with like a little gas canister. So I can only guess that in France, that is not acceptable. Okay. Um, it says the plants usually die completely within a couple of days and thermal weeding is considered an approach to sustainable weed management. Um, basically the plant is killed with hot air. It is not burned. It's just like scorched. <laughs> um, if it were burned, it would be releasing harmful chemicals to into the air, which defeats the whole purpose of this process. So the question I had is what impact do these incredibly high temperatures have on the various types of headstones and monuments found in a cemetery? Um, additionally, what impact does that have on the burials? Um, and I'm asking that because this site that I looked at, the uh, Ripa Green site, they make a specific quote about cemeteries. And this is what they say. Um, they use high velocity, hot air technology that blows hot air at high speed and passes it between the graves and nooks and crannies of the cemetery. So in my mind, that means that this hot air is not just going like around the headstones and things like that. It's actually going into the cracks. Um, a lot of these cracks lead straight down into vaults and a lot of these vaults lead straight down to where the remains are. Um, so I, I have a lot of questions about that. What's the impact on like the dirt underneath the ground? Um, what's the impact on the materials that bodies are in? What's the impact on coffins and things like that? Um, I, I just have so many questions about this. Uh, what is the impact on tree roots if you have trees in your cemetery? Um, everything I read, it makes it sound like this um, thermal weeder emits a heat wave and sort of like a, a direction, like a directional wave. And it's a wide kind of scope of heat. So you can cover a large portion of ground in a very short amount of time. I just wonder how controllable that is. Um, one site I read said you needed to be within 10 centimeters of something, like of the weed that you want to kill, which is really, really close, actually. So I don't know. I don't know. I just have a lot of questions and I don't have a lot of answers about this. I've never heard of this before. I don't know what this does. This is new to me. Like I said, I keep thinking flamethrower. <laughs> I know it's not, but that's what my brain keeps thinking. So, I mean, if you know anything about these thermal weeders, maybe you work with them in a store or sell them. Maybe you've worked with them on a farm. Maybe you use them at your cemetery. Let me know, like, what's the deal with these things? How do they work? Are they really effective? Um, do they damage different materials as you're, you know, walking through using them wherever you're using them? Have you noticed them damaging materials? Um, for stonemasons out there, um, uh, geologists, people who understand how like rocks work when they're uh, compressed, you know, with such a heavy weight that we get from headstones and they're superheated quite suddenly, like what happens with these thermal weeders, what impact does that have on like granite, on marble, on slate, on soapstone, on, you know, like on all these various stones we see in the cemetery? 
uh, and I'm particularly interested in like historic cemeteries. Is this something people would want to use in a historic cemetery where the stones are much more fragile? All right, uh, let's see. So in my research, I could not find anything that explains the impact such high temperatures might have on um, these elements in the cemetery that I mentioned previously. Um, it was not exhaustive research by any means. Um, some of my access to sites in France is limited. Um, and most of the sites I found that are talking about it are talking about it in French, which is uh, a huge like wall for me because my French is not there. And I don't want to just depend on translated pages because I can see with what I have already that it's not perfect. It does give us an idea of what's going on, though. It gives me an idea, at least. Um, and so in my video, you'll notice that I mentioned um, towards the end, I think, uh, that I didn't see any like weed eater marks or lawnmower marks on the headstones. Um, normally in a cemetery, when people use weed eaters, that plastic on the end of it like rips, whips around and it leaves these striations and grooves on a stone over time. A lot of times it makes the base of the, the monument or whatever look a little ashy. Um, and it almost looks like claw marks sometimes, depending on how long it's been done. And over time, that will eat away at the stone and eventually break it. Um, even if you use like the, the softest, um, string for your, your weed eater, it still leaves marks. And so I specifically look for those when I go to cemeteries, um, because in the past I've worked at cemeteries where I pointed out these and they're like, you can't prove that our groundskeepers did this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, I can, because where else they come from. These marks come from weed eaters. They come from the blades on lawnmowers and things like that. Um, so yeah, I didn't notice a lot of that at the uh, Mont Rouge Cemetery. So I thought that was really interesting. But what I did notice, and I didn't point it out in the video, but you should look at the base of some of the stones, especially the lighter colored like monuments and things as I'm walking through, they're dark. It's darker at the base near the ground. Um, and now knowing what I know and thinking back, I wonder if this superheating process is like baking the stone in some way. And you know, like when things are exposed to heat, they sort of get darker. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's damaging the stone, but it is changing the appearance in some way. If that is what's going on, I'm not saying it is, it's just a, a, a question, a hypothesis, a theory that I have. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? Oh, just my little wrap up. So um, while I couldn't find much information about this while I'm here, I do plan to continue researching this like when I get back to the States, because I'm really curious. If, if this process is as effective and impactful as it appears to be here in uh, Paris, then why aren't we using this in the United States? Now, I didn't look at the cost. Let me see. Just jump on this site. So they have an easy kit. You can ask for a quote. You can request brochures. So they don't even give you prices online. I hate it when people do that. Like, just tell me how much the machine costs. It's so annoying. So we're never going to know how much it costs because I'm not requesting a brochure. I'm not giving them all my information. Um, and that's that's unfortunate. Um, I would guess they're fairly expensive because people usually only do that when stuff is expensive. And then they try to get you these like, you know, good, better, best type deals to find whatever works for you in your situation and. They package you with all kinds of things like cable TV. <laughs> and 
And uh, before you know it, you have spent thousands of dollars. But, you know, if one of these could help, you know, clear a 50, 60 acre cemetery in less than an hour, it's worth the investment. It really is worth the investment. Um, I have questions about the care and upkeep of such a device. Um, do you need access to an electrical outlet? Uh, could a generate generator work? Um, I mean, generators usually run off of gas, which kind of defeats the purpose. But my point here with the cemeteries is not necessarily to be like zero phyto, but like to get rid of the weeds. <laughs> Um, zero phyto is a plus if we can do that. Um, but yeah, I just have so many questions, y'all. So many questions. I think this is amazing. I think what uh, Mont Rouge as a city is doing is amazing. Their incorporation of the cemetery into this plan. I mean, the cemetery is really a staple of this plan. Um, and we see it. We can visibly see the impact walking through the cemetery. And that to me is like a win. They've, they've done it. Like they did what they were trying to do, in my opinion. Um, now they're still going through certification processes and things like that for the city. But to me, this is a win. Um, so yeah, I just wonder, why is this such a big deal in France? And why have I heard nothing about it in the U.S.? Like what's going on? That's all I got for you. Um, if you want to look up more about this information, again, uh, I'll have the links to the websites in the description. There's only three major sites that I use. Um, you can also do Google searches for zero phyto, for thermal weeders, for insect hotels, for uh, municipal gardeners. Um, all of these terms will bring up something along the lines of what you're looking for here. Um, I also want to add eco-responsible, not just eco-friendly, but eco-responsible. That's a big key word here. Um, other than that, you can check out my blog, www.aplaceforkp.com. Um, all of my videos that are posted on YouTube have a larger story that happens on the blog. It's all connected. You can't separate one from the other. If you want the full impact, you got to access both things. So, you know, like, subscribe on YouTube. Go to my blog. You can sign up for notifications whenever a new blog post comes out and you'll be completely in the loop. Okay. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something because I know I did. And I will see you next time on A Place for KP. Bye.